Loving God, on this Yom Kippur, our hearts, as always, turn to you. We praise you, Lord, for you are awesome beyond our understanding or comprehension. You are a merciful God who loves us and calls us into greater unity and, con and connection with you. And now, Lord, as we join together for worship, we ask that you would fill this place with your Holy Spirit and that our worship would be pleasing in your ears and in your heart and that we would be, in fact, drawn closer to you. We pray these things with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now I invite you to sing our first song, which is Seek Ye First. Let's stand and sing together.
Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 17 to 31, and Diane is our liturgist. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, And who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age. Houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. The word of the Lord. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. So you'll find in your bulletins that on the back of the lyric sheet is um, the scripture for today. And I invite you to take it out and have it ready or use your own Bible because we are going to be looking at this uh, with each line and thinking about what it all means and putting it together. then who can be saved? That's what the astounded disciples were asking each other. After hearing what Jesus said to this rich man, they were, they were really in disbelief. But let's back up just a little bit. So Jesus, it seems, is setting out on another journey. And if you read further on in Mark chapter 10, you'll see he's actually headed to Jerusalem for the last time. And there's the show car. <laughs> <laughs> and Jesus is going to soon tell his disciples that he already knows what's going to happen to him once he gets there. So the time is getting really short, and Jesus needs his followers to understand, to really, really understand who he is and what he is going to do for them. That he is the way into the kingdom of heaven. Now, Jesus had just been happily spending time with a group of little children, a bunch of them, and I can just see them mobbing all around him and being so full of joy. And of course, then the disciples try to get these little ones away. And Jesus says, don't do that. Don't do that. Of such is the kingdom of heaven. After all the time that Jesus has spent with his disciples and his followers, they still don't really get it. After all, all these children have to offer is their trust and their faith and some joy. <clears throat> and it turns out, that's perfect. That's it. So now let's, let's take a look at today's scripture. The first two verses. 
In 17 and 18, as you see, we hear that a man has approached Jesus. Well, actually, he ran up to him, didn't it? He, he ran up and he knelt before him. And that's a pretty good start. Because later in verse 22, we're going to find out that this man is very rich. And so therefore, he would have held a position of power in that town. But this same man has chosen to not just run up to exuberantly Jesus, but also to kneel before him. And that speaks volumes. It says that he is recognizing someone else who has more power and authority than he does. He's honoring Jesus. And then this man does something interesting. He calls Jesus good rabbi, good teacher. And this kind of goes over our heads because we don't really know the language of the day. But here's the interesting thing. There is no instance in all of the Talmud of a rabbi being addressed as good rabbi, or good master, or good teacher. Not even the chief priest. Not even the head of the Sanhedrin. Only God was called good. Told in Hebrew. So before Jesus answers the question the wealthy man has about how do I inherit eternal life, Jesus wants to address the salutation that he has just given. Now we usually, when we read this, we say, why do you call me good? But it's actually, why do you call me good? Because again, no one is good but God alone. That's what Jesus says. And he's not asking this angrily or in a challenging way. It was more like, oh, I think this guy's on the right track. Tell me, why are you using that to address me? Does this man really recognize who Jesus is? If so, he's one of a very few. Now the crowd has stopped because Jesus has stopped, and they're paying close attention to this interesting interaction. Will some of them have the aha moment that Jesus is hoping people are going to have? But Jesus doesn't wait for an answer to this important question. We don't know what the man said. Instead, Jesus moves to the man's question, and you might think he's actually answering it, but that's not what's happening here. Take a look at verse 19. Jesus does not say, do you know your commandments? He says, you know the commandments, and then he lists some of them. Some of them. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, or bear false witness, or defraud. You should honor your mother and your father. So here's what's going on. He's simply saying, these are the commandments you know. And these are the commandments you have kept. And in fact, the rich man backs this up. He says in verse 20, just that, that he had been diligent about all these very commandments, the six listed. So now, look again at that list of commandments <laughs> that Jesus said, this man knew so well. What important commandment did Jesus leave out in that list? Anybody? I have no other God before, before God. Yeah, the first one. Yeah. You shall have no other gods before me. I am God, you shall have no other gods before me. Now turn again to verse 21. It says, Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then, come follow me. So this man who is rich in money, and rich in things, and power, and control, lacks one thing. And it has everything to do with the commandment that was left out. You shall have no other gods before me. Because this man is having trouble putting God in first place, isn't he? First place in his heart and his mind and his spirit. He, he wants to do what's right, we know that. He wants to inherit eternal life. But his mortal life is going so well. 
He doesn't really want to mess with it. He's got some level of power and control. He likes control, just like the rest of us. He has everything he could ever want. And he can't picture parting with this life the way he knows it to be. He can't picture parting with his stuff. Verse 22 is so interesting. It says, when he, this man, when he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. So we know these possessions are keeping him from putting God first. It's a given. They've become something of a God. They've taken first place. But we also have to ask the question, why is this man described as being shocked? Why is he shocked? The answer is kind of simple. The man believed what the religious leaders and the culture had taught for quite some time, that wealth and possessions were a sign of God's favor for righteous people. So the poor were thought of as being out of favor with God. And the wealthy were assumed to be God's favorites. That's what people thought. After all, in Proverbs uh, chapter 22, verse 4, it says, The reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. So this rich man thought he was doing well. He's shocked to think that there's more to it than what he had been doing. Jesus told him in verse 21 that the real treasure was kept for him in heaven. But all this was too much for this man, and he went away grieving. He was grieving. What he thought, that balloon had just been popped. His worldview has been turned upside down. He thought he had been doing all the right things. And he'd hoped that this had just indeed earned him his place in eternity. And some think maybe he was just looking for a pat on the back from Jesus. We don't know if that's true. But he had clearly forgotten the first commandment, the one Jesus left out. You shall have no other gods before me. Especially not the God of wealth. Especially not the God of control, the God of power, the God of position, the God of stuff. So how sad that this man seemed so close to the truth. He seemed to know who Jesus is. And he so wanted eternal life with God. He just wasn't ready to put God above his own power, position, and possessions. It's useful for us to think about that too. Are you putting power, position, and possessions above God? Now, if you look at verses 23 and 24, we have the rich man disappearing into the distance. And Jesus turns to his followers and says, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at his words. The man was shocked. The disciples are perplexed. It's the same thing. They had the same mindset that the rich man had. They didn't come up with this on their own. This is what was taught. That God must really be blessing those wealthy people and punishing those poor people. And the sick, too, by the way. They thought the same thing. Now, we know Jesus had been teaching something entirely different from that over and over again. But his followers, like us, are sometimes a little bit slow to pick things up and really grab onto them. So Jesus repeats his message. Wendy, what's the Greek term for when you repeat the message? Uh, uh, Starts with E. Epizuxis. Epizuxis. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Epizuxis. When, when you see in Scripture that something is repeated, it means pay attention. Yes, epizuxis. So Jesus says children. Now he's telling you the second time. Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. And then comes the famous verse. Verse 25. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle 
than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. We all know that line, right? You heard a lot of sermons on that one? Yeah, yeah me too. There are two interpretations for the phrase, eye of the needle. One is very simple. The tiny hole at the top of the needle. The other is a theory developed a while back that there must have been a gate in first century Jerusalem with the name Eye of the Needle. And the story goes that it was so small, anyone on the camel would have to get off, make the camel go down on his knees, unload everything that was, it was packed on his back, and then crawl through having let go of your stuff. And of course that would preach. I've heard that one. Yeah, it, it's good, it sounds great. The first interpretation, the little hole at the top of the needle, is saying it's impossible for a rich man to get into heaven. The second is saying it's really challenging but not impossible for a rich man to get into heaven. So which one do you think people like better? <laughs> yeah, the second one. They like the second one better, and as I said, I've heard that preached many times. The problem is, the second popular interpretation of the gate called the eye of the needle has no biblical, no archaeological, and no historical or scriptural evidence at all. It's just not in there. In fact, the first mention, and I read this whole dissertation on this because I really wanted to know, the first mention of it is uh, Thomas Aquinas, 13th century. He claimed that St. Anselm of Canterbury believed it. Now, Anselm lived in the 11th century. Before that, there's no mention of this anywhere, anyhow, no one, nothing. 11 centuries after Jesus, somebody thought this might be a good interpretation. Now, there are places in Jerusalem called, this is the gate of the eye of the needle. But guess what? They just sprang up recently for the benefit of us Christian pilgrims. <laughs> yeah. They're clearly, and we have all the gates listed, we have maps, we have detailed description of what Jerusalem looked, up, looked like and all the names of the gates. It's not in there. Now the other interpretation, the other problem with the interpretation of it being some gate somewhere is that um, it's in the Gospels themselves. Matthew and Mark and Luke all mention this event with the camel in the eye of the needle. But they each describe it slightly differently. One of them talks about a tailor's needle. Another one of them talks about a surgeon's needle. They're calling it by all different names. We know that if it was a specific place, they would use the same proper name every time. Just like we say, we're gonna cross over the George Washington Bridge. We don't say we're gonna cross over the bridge that is named after George Washington. We, we call it its proper name. It's not what the gospel writers did. So, and that's because they're talking about what Jesus was talking about, which is the tiny hole at the top of some kind of needle. They're talking about the impossible. In verse 26, the disciples are said to be astounded at this. And they ask, well then how can anyone be saved? If a seemingly righteous, blessed, rich man is in trouble and has about as much luck as a camel trying to go through the eye of a needle, how is this going to work for any of us, they're thinking? Well, finally, they're asking the right question. That's the question. Who can be saved? And Jesus is happy to answer them. If you look at verse 27. Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals it is, what? Impossible. Impossible. But not for God. For God, all things are possible. Jesus literally says that the point of bringing up the whole camel and needle thing in the first place is that it was impossible. It can't happen. And he's, that's why he's intentionally using a really absurd image to make his point. And you know what? That impossible thing will not happen except if God himself does it. And that's the point. That's the point. That's why Jesus said this using the example of a rich man that blew everybody's minds. A man everybody knew had that ticket to heaven and he can't possibly get in 
that no one can get in on their own. There is no way to work your way into heaven. End of story. Except it's not the end of the story, thank God. Because God alone loves to make the impossible happen. We do get into the kingdom of heaven, but through Jesus Christ alone. Now, with all this going on, Peter's been listening with astonishment. But he heard something that caught his attention, and he brings it up. You'll see it in verse 28. He says to Jesus, look, we've left everything and followed you. Remember, the rich man was asked to give up all his worldly goods and follow Jesus and couldn't do it. But the disciples had done just that, given up everything and followed Jesus. And in verses 29 and 30, Jesus lets them all know that their sacrifice does have great value. What they gave up, what they were willing to let go of, would be returned to them at some, in some way in this life first. And that return was going to look like family, a new kind of family, a community, a new kind of work. Some of them, as we know, had to let go of certain family members who thought they were crazy to follow Jesus. But they had gained a new church family and belonging in the body of Christ. Some of them we know gave up their livelihoods. Think of the tax collectors. That was a lucrative job. But they gave it up to follow Jesus. And what they gained was a new job, a life calling as a disciple and an apostle for Jesus Christ to the world. But according to verse 30, these earthly gains would not be without persecution. In fact, persecution is pretty much guaranteed. But the true treasure is revealed in the last part of verse 30. Those who belong to Jesus, who let go of worshiping worldly things, will receive eternal life in the age to come. And of course, that's the best gift of all. It's what the rich man was hoping for. I like to think he finally got it. But we don't get to hear the rest of his story. Now finally, verse 31 rounds this all out with a message that Jesus gives many times. The first will be last, and the last will be first. And of course, this brings us back to where we started, with Jesus saying the kingdom of heaven is a place filled with children. It's made up of those who have childlike faith. Faith and trust and joy. It's not made up of those who are self-important, who think their riches are all self-made, or that their power they got all by themselves. It's made up of those who remember the first commandment, and so they have no other gods before the one true God. So who can be saved? Those who have no other gods, no attitudes, no agendas or resources or politicians placed up on pedestals who worship God before and above all and everything else, who know they cannot work their way into heaven, and who know they need Jesus to unlock the door. He holds the keys to eternal life. The last shall be first, the first shall be last, and no one, Jesus said, no one comes to the Father except through him. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you that you love to make the impossible possible. We thank you that you go to so the, the nth degree to bring us in, to show us your truth, and to invite us to be part of your kingdom. And we ask, Lord, that you would help us to always place you first, to recognize that all that we have has come from you as a gift, and that you are the only and true way to eternal life. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.